Hey, my name is Gary Lambert, and I'm welcoming you, welcome you to patent, trademark, and copyright law for the wastewater industry. Uh, I'm a patent attorney, and uh, I thank you for a uh, patent and trademark attorney, and I thank you for joining this presentation. And I want to let you know right off the bat that the uh, if you've got any questions, just feel to uh, ask them. And, uh, there's a, apparently a way that you can submit these questions. I'm going to be able to answer them, and then we're going to be able to marry up the questions and the answers on the presentation down the road. So jump right in uh, at any time, and, and feel free to ask me a question. I've got a picture here of a wastewater treatment plant. That's what immediately comes to my mind when I think of wastewater, although I know a lot of you out there do a lot of different things in the wastewater industry. So. Uh, uh, Excuse my Boston accent. Like I said, we pronounce wastewater up here. Uh, waste W A T A. I've got a, a wastewater spelled correctly on the screen, and hopefully you'll be able to understand uh, just about everything I've got to say. If you're from the Midwest and other places other than the North Northeast, but uh, that's me. Uh, my name is Gary Lambert. As I said, I'm the principal and uh, senior partner at Lambert Shortell and Connaughton in Boston, Mass. That's a picture of me outside our office in uh, happier and uh, more crowded times than we have right now. Notice no one has a face mask on. That is a, a picture from uh, last summer. But we have two offices. Uh, our main office is in Boston, Mass. We also have an office in Nashua, New Hampshire. And all we do is intellectual property law, which is an umbrella term for patents, trademarks, copyrights, and litigation. Now, primarily, I do patent and trademark litigation. Uh, other members of the firm file trademarks, they file patents, but I do the litigation part primarily. And um, I've been doing this thing for about 36 years. Now, I, I started my legal career, I became a lawyer at 24. I started cutting my teeth as a criminal prosecutor in the Marine Corps. Uh, 1987, I got off active duty. I went into the reserve, and essentially, I've had two careers since then. I've always been in my my firm, and then I've also spent 35 years in the Marine Corps Reserve uh, as an infantry officer, and believe it or not, uh, doing some trademark work for the Marine Corps. One of my claims to fame was that I was able to obtain the trademark registration for the Marine Corps Marathon. And uh, you may think it would have been an easy task to do, but we got a merely descriptive rejection on it initially. And I beat that rejection by an affidavit from President Bill Clinton that I did not obtain personally, but that the, the, the Marine Corps obtained that basically said it was not descriptive. So uh, I've had two great careers. And even though I'm retired from the Marine Corps, of course, I still practice law uh, in Boston doing IP work. So. Um, Moving on, I, if I were there, I would hand out my business cards to you guys. Uh, that way you have a way to contact me. I can't do that. So I'm doing it virtually here. And as you can see, you've got all the information you need to get a hold of me. Uh, you'll notice I've got my cell phone number on there. A lot of people can't believe that. But the way I look at it, you want to talk to me, I want to talk to you. You got to remember that we work by the hour here. so. Um, usually when people call me, they want to talk, I, I'm, I'm willing to talk to them if they're willing to pay me my hourly rate. So my cell phone, my email is on there, the Boston office is on there. And as you can see, we have two offices. Now, just keep this in mind, because I'm a registered patent attorney, even though we practice in Boston and in Nashua, I can practice anywhere in the country as a patent attorney. Uh, I've been to courts throughout the country. Um, I can get admitted pro hack BJ, and uh, we are not limited to filing suits in Boston or representing people in Boston or Nashua. It's a national operation. So on to the details. Now we're going to talk primarily about trademarks. Uh, we're going to get into patents and copyrights, but trademarks, in my opinion, are the meat and potatoes of what you guys are doing out there. If we're, you're a plumber. If you're a wastewater treatment plant, if you make products in the industry, everybody's got a trademark, whether it's your business name or whether it's a product you sell or whether it's a service that you have. So, um, and by the way, a lot of times what you hear out there is 
a trademark, a service mark, and a lot of times they get lumped into the same thing, a trademark, and, and it is. But a trademark identifies goods, okay? And a service mark identifies a service. But as, I, as you can see on the screen, a trademark is a brand name. And everybody has a brand. Everybody should have want a brand. And that's what a trademark is. But it's anything, as you can see, any word, name, symbol, device, combination, to identify and distinguish the goods and services of one seller or provider from another. And it indicates the source of the goods or services. All right. Now, I've got some examples of trademarks and service marks in the wastewater industry up here. Um, so I mentioned what trademarks and service marks are. Within the category of trademarks and service marks, there are two types of them in each category. There's a word mark and then there's a service mark. And a word mark is merely the word by itself, okay? So if you see up at the, uh, the top of the screen, you'll see a la. Um, that's, a that's a design mark because there's a design associated with it. But if it was a word mark, it would just be A-L-A-A. -A -A. I'm sorry, A-L-A-R. There's my Boston accent kicking in. I want to put an A on everything. But here's a general rule of thumb on this that you can't take it to the bank 100%, but in most cases, it, this is the case. A design mark is a lot weaker than a word mark. Uh, and, and the best way to describe that in the trademark business is less is always more. You've heard that phrase before, but that is, that's the case with this. And, it, and here's why. A word mark is just a word, so it's a very strong, strong mark. It's also a diff, more difficult mark, generally speaking, to get registered at the Patent and Trademark Office because it is so strong. Now, when you add things to it, like you take a look at the top of the screen, you'll see TIG, a new Terra company. And they've got the design of the uh, the drop of water there. They got a lot of stuff going in. I see about three trademarks all in one there. But the reason why that's a weaker trademark than a word mark is say there was someone out there that wanted to use that drop of water, uh, maybe even a similar symbol, but a different name. Now, I don't think Tig would like that. And Tig would go to them and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, you guys, you, you, you've copied our design. And that other company, they would probably say, uh, I'm not sure it would work, but they can certainly say, hey, wait a minute. I don't know what the confusion is. confusion is. We've got a different name associated with that design. You see, and then you just put yourself in a bad position. Now, if you've got a lot of money, not a lot of money to spend, but a fairly good budget, you can get word marks and design marks. But if you're going to pick one, generally speaking, you want a word mark. And then go for that fancy design mark down the road. So let's move on. Now, here's a, uh, a comment that I get all the time in the business. And like I said, I've been doing it for 36 years. Well, IP work for about 33 years. They, clients call me up, they come in the office. I want to trademark X. Well, great. Um, actually, you don't. That's what I tell them. You don't want to trademark. You probably already have a trademark. Because if someone is using a brand, whether it's a design mark, word mark associated with goods or services, if they're using that already, they've already got a trademark. They've already got trademark common law rights, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. But uh, what they want when they say, I want to trademark something, is they actually want a registration at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. That's what they need. And you'd be surprised how many even lawyers I get, get a call from, and they're like, hey, can you trademark this for my client? But that the proper terminology is a registration. That's what everybody's going to want here. So this is what a registered trademark, this is what you get to put on a registered trademark if you get one. That famous circle with an R in the middle of it, which means registered. Most people recognize that. They recognize it as a trademark. In fact, this is such an important uh, symbol that, of course, you get to use it once you get a registration. But it is also unlawful to use this symbol before you get a registration. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen clients show up and they want to get a, re a registration on something. And they've already got this R next to it, uh, you know, jumping the gun. They didn't think it was any big deal, but it is a big deal. So uh, it's great to have, but don't put it on your trademark until you get a registration. Now, what a lot of people see sometimes too 
is the TM. That indicates that from the person who has that trademark, he's telling or he or she is telling the world that they have common law rights to that trademark. They might have a registration, but they're definitely telling people, we believe this to be a trademark, a protectable trademark, and we're just letting you know. I just want to go back a slide here because I want to show you up here, if you can see my arrow, a law has got the TM next to it, which they are indicating, you know, we have trademark rights in this. Now, maybe they don't have a registration on it. Uh, maybe they do and they just didn't update it, but they're letting people know there. But if you go over to TIG, you'll see the uh, the small R with a circle around it, which they are definitely telling folks, we got a registered name here. And the other trademarks that I happen to get off the web, nothing next to them. Now that doesn't mean you don't get any um, you don't get any superior rights by doing this. But I tell you what, you do get if you're telling the world that you have a trademark and a registered trademark, and then it's determined that there is infringement on that trademark. If you've got the R on that with the circle around it, you can now claim that it was intentional. And if you can claim intentional infringement, you can get enhanced damages if you get to trial. So let's move on to common law trademarks. So this is really cool. Compared to patents and trade, uh, patents and copyrights, you don't get any rights until you get the patent, until it's issued. On the copyright, you can't do any suing or enforcement until you get the registration. Not the case with trademarks. With trademarks, you get immediate rights by using that trademark uh, out there in, in the public, whether it's on your products, whether it's on your website. And unlike a lot of countries, you get protectable rights immediately upon using those trademark rights. So uh, now, here's something that used to matter. And I know, I know you guys can see me in, the, in the, the screen here, so you can see I've got gray hair. But I used to do this before the internet. So back in the day, the last phrase down here, it exists only for the specific area where the mark is used. That used to mean something. So if you use this trademark in Boston and you never left Boston and the only advertisement you did was Boston, you were stuck with that. Now, most people are using trademarks on a website which goes around the world, never mind around the nation. So essentially, your use of that trademark on your website is going to give you common law rights basically throughout the country. And that's a good and a bad thing. We're going to get in the jurisdiction down the road. But that also means you can you might be able to be sued in various places where you might not have been sued or been able to be sued years ago because of your use of that trademark. Anyway, so here's the place where everybody wants to go. This is where this is where we make our bread and butter. This is where we hang out, the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This is where you get patents and trademarks. Two different buildings, but the, uh, the office is, is named the same here. Now, um, as I mentioned before, and you see on my card, you see I've got registered patent attorney. I just got to explain to you what that means, not to toot my horn, but to kind of give you a fill in and fill you in on uh, what you're getting out of a registered patent attorney. So I am admitted to the patent bar at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And in order to get there, in order for any patent attorney, registered patent attorney to get there, you got to be a member of the state bar in the state that you're in. And you also have to take a special exam at the US Patent and Trademark Office. And by the way, the pass rate wasn't too great. I don't know what it is lately, but it, when I took it, it was about 35%, 39%, somewhere around there. And in order to take that bar exam, you've got to have a degree in engineering or science. So as you can see, that knocks out a lot of attorneys that might want to do this because a lot of attorneys, they went to college and took up power sci, history or whatever. They didn't major in engineering or science. And I always tell people that most of us in the patent field, um, we, we, took a, we took a wrong turn. Like, in other words, we wanted to, we started wanting to either be an engineer or a scientist, and we ended up going to the law school to be patent attorneys. But uh, what I do now, you don't have to be registered to be a trademark attorney. But that's like telling me that I'm allowed to do wills and trusts. Uh, which I would never touch in a million years. I don't even touch my own. So that's how dangerous it can be. So while any attorney can technically deal with trademarks, not patents, but trademarks, I would highly recommend that anyone out there seeking an attorney 
uh, make sure that they're, that's what they do. They do trademark law and they're not doing trademark law on the side. Anyway, we are no stranger to the wastewater business. Uh, this is one of our uh, trademarks and one of our registrations. Now, the trademark here is wastewater services. You probably, if, if anybody out there knows anything about trademarks, you're probably saying, how the heck did you get a registration on wastewater services? Isn't that generic? Isn't that too descriptive? Well, actually, you're right, it is. And I use this as an example to tell you, there are two registers at the USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office. There's a principal register for those trademarks that have acquired distinctiveness or what we call secondary meaning or, an, or inherent distinctive, distinctiveness. And then there's a supplemental register, which is waste, where wastewater services are on, for those trademarks that are merely generic or descriptive. Now, have no fear, you don't get stuck here if you don't want to stay there. After five years, you can petition to go on the principal register. You've got a quiet distinctiveness, and now you want to be on the principal register. But um, I just want to let you all know that, that even though you might have a merely descriptive name, like our client here, Wastewater Services, that's in Bridgewater, uh, all is not lost in getting a registration at the PTO and eventually in five years after this registration date, we're gonna be able to probably get those folks on the principal register. All right, I wanna walk you through some of the principal registrations here that involve wastewater, just for your own knowledge to, to tell you what matters. And when you read one of these things, if someone sends you one, someone might claim you might be infringing their trademark uh, you might want to claim that someone's infringing their trademark, but I want to go over some of the important points on these registrations that matter when you're evaluating this. So yeah, the registration is always important. That's the owner. The registered date, uh, that's important because the examiner at the Patent and Trademark Office can only deal with who filed first, okay? Uh, and, that, and that's why the, the, the filing date is always important here down here. Uh, in this case, January 28, 2015. But registration is always important too. I mean, the registration date. Now, the international class, 37, what does that mean? There's 45 different classes out there. And by the way, each one of them costs $275 to get if you're filing a trademark application. But in this case right here, you can see it's a service trademark uh, or service mark, I guess, for installing, maintaining, and repairing septic systems. Now, here's the most important part of any trademark registration, the first use. And it's, it's amazing since all these things are in bold, this is kind of not in bold and people might think, well, it's not that important. Hey, first use is everything in trademark. Uh, it, 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 it dictates everything in the end. As I say, when the smoke clears, what matters is first use. So for example, say you get into a, a spat with someone else, and you claim they're infringing your trademark or uh, they're, they're claiming you, they infringe your uh, theirs, it's about if there is a likelihood of confusion, and I'm gonna get into what that means, but that's the test for trademark infringement. But if there is a likelihood of confusion, then the only determination that matters is who is using it first. And he who or she who used it first on a likely uh, of likelihood of confusion trademark issue wins. So that's the way that works. Um, notice some of the other things here, like wastewater solutions. No claim is made to the exclusive right to use that apart from the name. You're always going to get that disclaimer on these type of trademarks uh, when you have generic terms in there. Okay, so this they're just letting everyone know this. Well, how this would come about is the examiner would call me up, or uh, if the client was pro se, call the client up and say, hey, wait a minute, you got to disclaim the right to use this generic terminology. All right, let's go on to another one. This actually is a trademark. Everyone was a service mark. And this is a design mark. And I'm going to talk about this design mark down the road in another slide. But you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here, and I call it too much junk. There's too much stuff. Um, and actually, there's three trademarks in there, if you really want to be honest with, uh, if I want to be honest with you. 
This is a trademark, this little droplet of water with the leaves. The gel max is a separate trademark. And this protecting the environment from wastewater pollution is actually a trademark. Now they've decided to combine all this into one. I don't know why. Maybe they did it themselves. Maybe uh, they only wanted to do one and they wanted it in. Maybe they paid a, an advertising agency a lot of money to come up with this and they didn't want to give it up. But um, once again, as I said before, a design mark is generally speaking always going to be a weaker trademark than a word mark. Because once again, if somebody's just using a little droplet here and they're using a different name, they're going to complain that there's no likelihood of confusion if Gel Max were to go to them and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's a confusion because you're using our symbol. So less is always better, less is always more. Once again, here's your registration date, international class 11. Um, in this case, it's a trademark, so they've got a filtration apparatus. Once again, first use, always down there. Sorry, I cut it off, but that's all I could get on the slide. All right, why should you register a trademark? In other words, I said, hey, you've got common law rights. Uh, common law is great. Why don't we just keep the common law rights and just move on? Why spend money at the reg uh, getting a registration? Lots of reasons, lots of good reasons. Number one, there's a legal presumption of ownership. I say presumption because once you get a registration for five years, if someone was out there, you know, and they were doing it longer than you were, and there's a likelihood of confusion between your two trademarks, they're going to win. If they come back in and they cause a fight at the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board down at the Patent and Trademark Office. So I got that legal presumption because that's what it is until after five years. Now, notice I have the little parentheses when state registration only provides rights within the state. Once again, as I said, I've been doing this for a long time, back in the day before the internet, state trademark registrations actually meant something. Um, you know, you could go down there and uh, if you were in Massachusetts, you could prevent people from Massachusetts from doing anything uh, that caused a likelihood of confusion with that trademark. Now, as I said, everybody's global, people are national, people have a website. State registrations, in my opinion, basically wasting your money on. Uh, I don't see any point to do that anymore if you get a federal registration. Another good reason, public notice of claim of ownership. People can go on the on the PTO website. I showed you a slide shot of that before. Look you up. Oh, wow, they, they, they can find you. They know that you're there. Same thing, listing in the USPTO's da database. If people want to do a search, you come up. Hopefully it deters them from filing a similar trademark. Here's the coolest thing, I think. You can you get a registration, you can record that registration with the US Customs and Border Protection Agency. For 190 bucks, there's over 300 port of entries. These folks will actually do your enforcement job for you. And they'll be on the lookout for infringing trademarks. And I know China's in the news with the, you know, the coronavirus lately, and not the pile on China, but let's face it. A lot of counterfeit material comes from China, and uh, they're doing a pretty good job enforcing patents and trademarks, but uh, I'm sorry, patents and, and copyrights, but not the case so much with trademarks. You know, all you got to do is go to New York, certain places in New York, and see the knockoff Rolexes, uh, Chanel bags, all that type of thing. But once again, you record with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Office, they're going to they're gonna actually help and prevent that stuff from coming in. Once again, it still finds its way in but you're going to have one uh, filter at least to work with. Once again, you get the right to use that federal registration symbol. We talked about that before. And you get to bring an action in federal court. Believe me, you want to be in federal court. You do not want to be in state court on the trademark case. You get a lot more rights, a lot more remedies in federal court. I'm more comfortable in federal court because federal court's the same wherever we go in the country. Uh, I don't have to worry about a state court in Texas or Iowa, even though I'm admitted in Iowa, but uh, you want to be in federal court. Uh, the judges there have a lot of experience in trademark cases, state court less that case, and you always want an experienced court uh, and judge when it comes to you know the subject matter you're talking about. And another reason why you want to register a trademark is you can use that registration as a basis to obtain a registration in a foreign country. I mean, how cool, you don't have to 
you know, reapply. Well, you, you apply, but you use the application and your filing date in the US as your filing date in that country. And this brings up a good topic that a lot of people ask me about. They'll call me and they say, I want an international trademark. There is no such animal. Um, trademark registrations are done by countries. Each country has their own, with the exception of the EU, the Euro European Union. Uh, that'll cover those countries in the EU. But other than that, every country's got their own system. No such thing as an international one. All right. So I can't, you know, I'm going to get questions from you folks, and, I, and hopefully I'll have answers for you. But in the meantime, I want to tell you about some of the questions I get when clients call me or come into my office. And like I say, this is a result from doing this for years and years. So they'll come in and say, can you trademark this name for me? What did I say before? I'm not in the trademark business. I'm in the trademark registration business. The client's in the trademark business. So uh, I don't do trademarks. Client does. Um, another one. I can get a trademark if the name is not taken, right? No. The quick answer to that question is no. Names being taken or not taken is not in the lexography of the trademark office. This is, it's not like going to the Secretary of State's office or going to GoDaddy about a domain name where you plug in a name, it doesn't come up, you get it, and away you go all within five minutes. No. It's about likelihood of confusion. We're going to get into that in detail, but whether it's taken or not is irrelevant because even if a trademark out there is identical to your trademark, if you're doing something different than what that person is doing or that company, you might be able to get the identical trademark. Uh, so whether it's taken or not is irrelevant. Another question, can you see if that trademark is available as if I was going to the Secretary of State's office? Once again, available, not taken, not part of the vocabulary that we use in the trademark business. Another question, or not our statement, I did my own search and I did not find that trademark. Now I'm going to get into, I'm going to show you what the trademark office search system looks like. Uh, but I cringe when I hear that uh, because if you didn't find anything, that means you didn't look hard enough because you're always going to find something that's going to be similar. So when you find, you know, folks doing their own search, once again, it's not like GoDaddy. Um, a little more complicated than that, and we're going to get into the details, but I want to talk about, I wanted to mention that at least. Now, here's the thing I hear comically very often. I came up with a name that's so unique that we do not have to do a search. I know it's not out there. Once again, not out there is not part of the vocabulary of a trademark office, because even if it is out there, I might be able to get you that trademark anyway as a registration. So. Um, there's no such thing as you came up with something so unique uh, that there might not be an issue. All right, so I showed you the, the main page of the trademark office on an earlier slide. To get to this page, you almost have to go through a maze. But if you make it to finally this page, this is their so-called search system. And you can see where my arrow point, if you plug in your name here, and you hit submit query, um, God only knows what can come up. Usually a lot of things will come up. But say you were to put in, um, like waste, yeah. Say you wanted, say you're from Boston and you wanted to go Boston wastewater and you wanted to go W-A-T-A. -A. So say you plug that in here. And say there was a company that was called Boston wastewater, but it was spelled correctly, W-A-T-E-R, right? So you submit the query. You know what you're going to get? You're going to get this slide. No TESS records were found to match the criteria of your query. Does that mean you're going to get a registration? Negative. You know why? Because Boston Wastewater, WTA, and WATER are the same. Okay? So people are going to think they're the same. There's a likelihood of confusion if you're, going, if you're doing the same type of thing. And that's why this is very misleading, this whole site. Now, to their credit down at the trademark office, they've got a warning here. After searching the database, even if you think the results are quote, okay, do not assume that your mark can be registered. No kidding. And I'm happy they put that up there. I hope a lot of people read that because 
Um, this is probably the most misleading uh, thing that I see out there in intellectual property work is this you know, search site here. How many clients have I gotten that have tried this, came up okay in their own mind, filed the application, got rejected, and then they finally come to me. I couldn't even begin to tell you, but I wish I had a dollar for each one of them. All right, I talked about this before. It's time to get into the meat and potatoes of trademark work. Likelihood of confusion, this is the test, folks. This is the test for whether or not you can get a trademark registration and whether or not someone is infringing your trademark or you are infringing someone else's trademark. So the test is a two-part test. It does not exist either with one or two. You must have one and two together. Number one, the marks are similar. Notice I did not say, and notice they did not say the same or identical, just similar. And the goods and services of the parties are related such that the consumer or consumers would mistakenly believe they come from the same source. Look, here's the important part about this. You see the consumers, the reason why I've highlighted consumers is it's not about people coming all the time. What do you think? Am I infringing this trademark? Do you think I can get a registration? We can give opinions, but in the end, it's the consumer that dictates. So if two or three consumers are calling one place thinking that they are the other, there's actual confusion. That's even better than the likelihood of confusion. That means there's trademark infringement. Whether I think there is, whether the client thinks there is, or whether you know their mom thinks it is, uh, the consumer always rules the day in determining you know, whether or not there is a likelihood of confusion. Good and bad, because you know, depending on the industry, you've got consumers at one end of the educational scale uh, compared to you know a higher a higher scale, and so even at the at the at the lower scale, like a, on a Walmart level, uh, you got two or three people that think one company is associated with another, you got trouble. All right, search a trademark database. One thing I want to point out here, so this is the screen that you get before you get to that search screen that I showed, like I say, the maze at the trademark office. Now, uh, maze being M-A-Z-E, for those of you who might not be able to understand every word I say here with my Boston accent. Um, I want to point out something. Once again, the trademark office is telling you, look for a similar trademark on related products and whether or not it's live. Let's talk about what live means. Because man, oh man, have I seen some real disasters with this. All right. When you do your search, when some things come up, this is, this is the screen you're going to see in front of you. And over here, these are serial numbers. These are registration numbers. This is the trademark. And this is whether it's live or dead. So technically speaking, when you see a dead trademark, yep, it's gone off the registration. And if you have a name that's identical to that name, let's just assume you know, you've got identical services, identical trademark, you're gonna be able to get that registration. Does that mean you're out of the woods? Let me tell you what dead means. Dead means they forgot to pay the maintenance fee. That usually does not mean they're not, still not doing business. That could be a problem because if they come back from the so-called dead, the dead trademark, and they file again, and they've got an earlier date of use than you do. What did I say? In the end, that date of use is going to win. So you can go ahead, get your application, even get it approved, even get your registration. Someone comes in to cancel with within five years of that registration, and they go, hey, I've been using it before you did. you got a problem. So uh, just keep that in mind. Now, sometimes dead can mean... You know, they got rejected, like here, no registration on this agriculture biodiversity. And by the way, if this gel max thing looks familiar, it was that earlier uh, design trademark, service mark that I was talking about. Looks like, guess who didn't pay their maintenance fee? Those folks. Okay. All right, let's move through this fairly quickly, but I wanted to give you some examples to give you a feel for what the trademark office considers similar. This is not Gary Lambert, it's not lawyers, it's not, I got this straight from the horse's mouth, right? This is the trademark office saying, these things are similar and violate that at your own peril. 
So for example, T Marquee co compared to T with a TEE -E Marquee, that's going to be considered similar. You punch this in the search term and it says good to go, and you didn't search this. Well, guess what? Trademark office thinks they're similar. Appearance. Well, this is fairly self-evident, but even you know, if the appearance is different, they're similar. How about this one? Lupo. Lupo is Italian for wolf. You want to call yourself the Lupo Plumbing Service. Punching Lupo Plumbing into the trademark office, nothing comes up, you think you're all set. When you file the trademark office says, whoa, not so fast, what's Lupo mean? Because they're going to want to know the meaning of every uh, foreign word. You're going to have to say it's wolf, and they're going to go, wow, we found a wolf plumbing. And guess what? You're going to be rejected. How about, you know, I always get, the, how about this one, city woman, city girl? Um, you could say, you know, plug that in and you think you're free and clear if it doesn't, if it doesn't come up. How about city girl, city female? Who knows what else could be out there that, that, that could be considered similar? All right, so that's the similarity trademarks. Now, remember, two-part test, you got to be similar and you got to be related. So here are some of the things that the trademark office says are related. And so their examples, unfortunately, do not involve the wastewater industry, but I think you guys can get a, feel, a fairly good feel for this. T-shirts and pants, same thing as hats. Banking services, going to be related to mortgage lending services. T-shirts and pants, again, with online retail. All right, moving on. So if you didn't, so if you got exhausted hearing me on that ground of refusal, which is a likelihood of confusion, surprise, surprise, there are others. So if you're primarily merely a surname, you can't get on the principal register. Now you can get on the supplemental, but you know, um, so you want to call it like Lambert. My name's Lambert. Lambert Plumbing. Uh, negative. I'm not going to be able to get on the primary. Now I know what you're thinking. You know, what about Dell Computer, Ford Motor Company, you know, Marriott Hotels? Those are, those are surnames. They sure are. But people don't think of the Ford Motor Company as, wow, that's Henry Ford's company. Or maybe they do, but they Ford is the Ford Motor Company, not necessarily a person. All right. So that's why they're on the principal register and not on the supplemental. Once again, another refusal, primarily geographic. You want to call yourself the Boston Plumbing Company? Probably not. Now, there is a company, for an example, for those of you guys who folks who have been up to Boston, Boston Sand and Gravel. Literally famous throughout Boston. Every job site's got them on there, and they've been around since, I don't know, since the Pilgrims showed up in Boston, probably. Anyway, uh, that is a... Uh, they've, they've got a quiet distinctiveness in that Boston Santa Gravel. So yeah, they're on the principal register, I'm sure. How about this one? Disparaging and offensive marks. Now, believe it or not, like I said, I've been doing this for 36 years. About once a year, I'll get a call from some client. They want to do something disparaging or offensive. That used to be a no-go. It is now allowed. I know it sounds wild, but this is all brand new turf, folks like within two years. Let me give you an example. So on a disparaging mark, there was an, uh, a band of Asian guys who wanted to call themselves the slants. They did call themselves the slants. They wanted to get a registration on the slants. Trademark office says, no way, that's disparaging. They took it all, all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, disparaging or not, you get a registration. You want to be offensive. There was a... Uh, Guy who wanted to get the uh, the words F U C T uh, registered, trademark office said no. He said yes. Went all the way to the uh, Supreme Court. Supreme Court says, hey, you can be offensive if you want to be. So now you can get disparaged. So if you want to call your wastewater company disparaging and offensive names, might not be good for business. But yes, you can get a registration on it. Other grounds for refusal. Foreign terms that translate to a descriptive or generic term. Once again, descriptive or generic terms are going to end you up on the supplemental register. Just because you got a foreign term doesn't get you out of it. Individuals name or likeness. You cannot get a registration 
on an individual's name without their permission. Okay. Title of a single book, negative. However, say you've got a series of books like the Harry Potter series, you can get a registration on the series of books. And then uh, matter that is used in the purely matter that is used in the purely ornamental manner. This gets confusing, but I'm going to talk about it briefly. All right, I'm going to use an example. So uh, on flight 93, you guys, folks, remember 9/11. Those of you who were, were around, uh, Todd Beamer said, "Let's roll," you know, on flight nine on the flight 93 when they were over the field in Pennsylvania. So the somebody decided they wanted to put that on T-shirts. Let's roll. That is merely ornamental. Okay, that use of that word. Now, if they wanted to open up a T-shirt company called Let's Roll T-shirts, or just Let's Roll, but make T-shirts, that's fine. Uh, that is not merely ornamental. But putting something like Let's Roll, or you probably have seen this shirt. You know, my grandma went to Boston, and all I got was this T-shirt. That's all on ornamental features. And you cannot get a registration on it. All right. I want to just bring up an example of uh, a company out there that seems to be pretty litigious, in my opinion. No offense if they're listening, but they seem to come up a lot because I've done a little bit of research. But and that's Vaqua Water Tech. They have, and as an example, I've got this up here. They sued WM Watermark um, for trademark infringement for sludge dryers. Alakwa had, Alakwa had J-Mate in Watermark, MW Watermark had dry mate. Took it to a jury trial, jury said, infringement. And notice those words are different, but it's got the mate in them. And they're doing the same thing and the consumer apparently was confused. But the jury awarded no damages. I gotta tell you that this is a common theme in trademark law. As I tell most of my clients, there is no money in trademark infringement. Because in order to, to collect that money, you're going to have to prove that the consumer actually bought the product because of the trademark, not because of the product. And I say, good luck to that, unless you want to spend, you know, 50 grand on an expert. So uh, a lot of cases out there, uh, there may be infringement and there may be injunctions, but there's not a lot of damages awarded in trademark infringement. Trade dress. I could be here all day on this thing because it's confusing as all get out, but I got to talk about it. I'm going to give you an example here because you folks are probably going to see it. But a trade dress is the total image or the overall appearance of, of anything. And this may include, you know, size, shape, color, color, color combinations, texture, graphics. A good example of trade dress, in my opinion, one of the most famous ones is the pink color in the Owens Corning fiberglass that you see, right? You see the Pink Panther, that's another trademark they got. But they actually have a trade dress, trademark registration on the pink color. So that's what how, how general trade dress can be. But it must be distinctive, two things. So you got two part test. You got to be distinctive, and that's either through inherent or acquired distinctiveness. And it cannot be functional. So if that pink part of that fiberglass was actually had something to do with insulation, or even if it affected the cost and quality of the article, uh, then that's functionality, you're not gonna be able to get a trade dress registration on it. All right. Here's an example I wanna show you. Here we go with a vodka water again. Like I said, I just, they seem to come up a lot. I gotta tell you, I give the lawyer and the, and the company here a lot of credit trying to go out and get this, but they got a trade dress registration, trademark uh, registration. And by the way, that, those terms are interchangeable here. They get it on this oxidation ditch for wastewater treatment. You can see the picture of the ditch. And so this is wild because, you know, I haven't said it yet, but trademarks are good forever and ever, as long as you renew every 10 years. Patents are only good for 20 years. So essentially, if they got to keep this, and for you know, for hundreds of years, they could prevent people from doing this oxidation ditch. So I don't know all the background, but it looks like they got in a fight with um, Lakeside Equipment Corporation. And I know there's a lot of words up on this thing, but this is the trademark trial and appeal board opinion, at least the first page of the opinion. But anyway, 
Uh, Lakeside took Evacua Water to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board and they said, hey, ju uh, judges, because it's a three judge panel, as you can see, uh, this thing is functional. And the judges agreed that it was functional and bye bye trademark trade dress registration. Because uh, I think we all probably could agree that it was probably functional, but it was Lakeside Equipment Corporation that took them to task and uh, they won. Now, the bad thing about this trademark trial and appeal board, I've been there many times, it is extremely time consuming, which means very expensive for clients. So, you know, the average plumbing company is not going to be able to, you know, one man band is not going to be able to uh, afford or shouldn't be able to afford uh, going to this thing. And so normally something like this is going to run you like 50K because it's a mini trial and it's going to take a year and uh, they won, but at you know what cost all right we're done with trademarks we're going to move into patents different part of the office different building what's a patent the right to exclude others from making using offering for sale or selling look how broad that is that means you know you're infringing something if you just offer it for sale not just use it not just make it uh but a patent is a legal monopoly that allows you to you know, prevent these people, other people from doing all these things. And as I tell people, a patent does not make you money. It prevents other people from making money. Now, you might make money by preventing other people from making it, but uh, a patent by itself is not going to, you know, it's not a check. Three types of patents. The last one's not going to apply to you folks, but I got them on there just in case, you know, you're at a cocktail party and you'll be able to tell people the different patents that are out there. There's utility patents. Those are the best types of patents. It's going to protect a process, a machine, an apparatus, you know, something with moving parts. Then you've got a design patent that only protects an ornamental design of an article. Now, don't snub your nose at design patents too much because in a lot of cases where we can't get a utility patent, we can get it, we can get a design patent. And uh, you can't snub your nose at design patents because the largest jury verdict in the history of America was a design patent, and that was for the Apple iPhone. So uh, they, they're, they're valuable in their own right. Certainly, generally speaking, not as good as a utility patent. You always want one of them, but uh, always good to get a design patent, better than no patent. And I doubt you folks are doing plant patents, but if you got an asexually reproduced plant, we can help you out with that department. All right, two part test for patents. You got to be novel and you got to be non obvious. Let me take the first step. You cannot get a patent if the invention was described in a printed publication or in public use, on sale, or otherwise available to the public. Most people, when I tell them this, they nod their head. I can't see you out there because this is a webinar, but they nod their head and they say, Yeah, I understand. No, they really, really mean it. Uh, public use means if somebody in Germany, China, Russia, if they use this one day before your filing date, you don't get a patent. And that means even if they didn't get a patent, they just used it. So maybe nobody gets a patent, but that's how strict they are. Now, um, if you publicly, if the inventor publicly disclosed this, you have a one year grace period to file. And by the way, who is the public? And I am not kidding when I say this, the public is anybody but your lawyer or your spouse, because of the, the, the uh, husband wife privilege. But um, the, of course you have the attorney client privilege and anybody else that are public, unless you got a non-compete. And I hope the non-compete's written what right, otherwise it's the public. All right, moving on. Second test, you can't be obvious to a person skilled in the art. A lot of mumbo jumbo here. Do not think of obviousness and art, the word obvious as you normally would. They had to come up with a term. They could have called it a dog. They could have called it a cat. But here's what the test is. An examiner can't say, hey, that thing's obvious. Go away. It's not patentable. The examiner can take, if, if you're novel, that means they can't find you in one patent. But the examiner can take two or three patents, all of which have a little bit of what you've got, 
put these things together and say, if I put these things together, I get you, your invention, and that makes you obvious. So that's the word they use to describe that put together process. All right, I apologize, deeply apologize for the small screen print here. I, I wanted to get the first page of a patent up to you. There's so much information on this, but um, uh, so you're just gonna have to bear with me on this. I just wanna go over a couple of things on, you know, when you see a patent, somebody sends you a patent, you get, here's what you gotta look at. The date of the patent, that's always important. Inventors, how many times have I had people come in they go, I want my wife on the patent. I don't want my wife on the patent. I want my husband on the patent. No, don't put my brother, you know, the, you can't do that. If you do that, if you pick and choose inventors, you're going to end up with an invalid patent. You must disclose full inventorship. So all, you, you know, all the inventors, anybody that contributed to this invention have to be listed. You don't do it, you're going to end up with an invalid patent if you end up litigating it because somebody's going to find out. Now, what I tell people when they don't want people on the patent or they want to put people on the patent, we can make anybody an assignee. We can move the legal ownership of that thing around anywhere. So that's, as you can see, you see an assignee on this case. Uh, file, filing date, always critical. Uh, utility patents, 20 years. You, can, you, don't, you don't go by the date of issue. You go by the date it was filed. And sometimes that can be a year or two before. So the clock starts ticking then. Classes, searches, people think you search patents by looking at words. No, you search them by class and subclass. This shows the classes and subclasses that the examiner looked at. Here's some references cited. You know what this means? Probably some of the claims, and I'll get to what claims are in a minute. Claims in the patents were rejected by some of these patents and they overcame them. But this is, the, this is what the examiner saw out there that is most closely related to this patent. And they got to be listed because if they're not listed, then down the road, someone can say, oh, the examiner didn't look at this patent. It's not listed. So therefore, he or she made a mistake. The patent's invalid, et cetera. I know it's a little complicated, but I, uh, I'm going to move on. Anyway, that was a utility patent. This is a design patent. A design patent merely protects, once again, the ornamental features. It's all about the drawing, folks. That's it. Uh, we're gonna talk about claims in a minute about utility patents, but you compare the drawings to the product and if they're quote, substantially the same, that's the test, uh, that determines infringement. Now, back to utility patents. This is what we call the drawing page. Sometimes this is a process patent, so you see steps, okay? And on an apparatus patent, you're gonna see a drawing of uh, the product itself. A lot of people look at the drawings and they determine whether or not they infringe or not based upon the drawings. Don't do it. It's got very little to do with it. The drawings are only there to help you understand the patent, how it works, and the claims. That's it. Uh, they do not determine the meets and bounds of what the deed is. What determines that is the claims. Go to the very end of a patent. There's where your claims are. That's the, the deed to the property. That describes what you can prevent others from doing. In this case, I've got a portion of a claim here, because I have no sense of putting the whole thing down. But this is a process claim. See, it's a method for reducing ammonia in the stream. Providing a stream, contacting the ammonia-containing stream with an oxygen-containing stream, la di da di da These are steps. So if someone is doing all these steps, they infringe. If they are not doing all the steps, they don't. Just one. All it takes is not doing one, and you don't infringe. So don't look at the drawings. Don't look at the rest of the patent. Look at the claims. And if you need to understand the claims, go back to the rest of the patent, which, by the way, is called the specification. Okay. Now, moving on. Copyright. Very common thing out there because all you guys got websites. It's all about copyright on a website. So this actually is, is this protection is grounded in the U.S. Constitution, done with the Library of Congress, not the Patent and Trademark Office, but it's granted for a original works of authorship. What the heck is an original work? 
Guess what it's not? New. Original does not mean new. I know it's going to blow you away or it might blow some people away. But if 20 people take the same photograph of the Boston skyline, and for those of you who have seen it, it's beautiful. Thousands of pictures have been taken. Guess what? Every single person has their own individual copyright to that picture. It's not new. Everybody's got the same picture, just about. Uh, everybody wants to get it right around dusk or dark with the lights, but it's original. And as long as it's original, um, you're good to go. And that's why sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, hey, I want to do a copyright search, see if this is okay. If you created the thing, you know, the picture, the the authorship, the uh, the written word, you got nothing to worry about. As long as you did it, you've got an original work. There's no need to do any searching because you get that unless you copied it from someone. What's it include? Literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, poetry, novels, movies, you name it. Here's what it doesn't protect. Facts, ideas, systems, etc. So for example, on your website, you've listed how to fix I don't know, how about a, we pick uh, a sink? How to take apart a sink? How to do the plumbing on a sink? And all, you know, you described it in a very nice way. You can protect someone from copying the way you said it. But what you can't prevent is someone from saying, hey, this is a great idea. This is great the way he's, you know, he or she has allowed me to uh, take apart the sink, put the sink back together. It doesn't protect the person from doing what's in the, the copyright. It just prevents somebody from going to the copy machine and copying what you exactly what you said. All right. So you might you might be able to protect that process through a patent, but you're not going to do it through a copyright. When is it protected? Immediately, the minute you put it on the computer in tangible form. That's on a computer. So now, even though that's when you get a copyright, here's the bad news. Uh, well, good and bad news. You need to register it. And registration for copyrights, really inexpensive compared to, you know, patents and trademarks. Um, you get a certificate of registration. Here's the deal. You cannot sue for copyright infringement unless you have that registration, not just apply. You got to register it. And that's going to take you about six months. So remember what I said before, patents, you need a patent. Copyright, you're gonna need a registration. Trademarks are the only thing you can sue on for common law reasons only. Now, here's what happens a lot. Please don't let it happen to you. People come to me, hey, somebody copied my stuff off the website. Did you get a registration? No, I didn't. All right, I can still file and we can still sue once we get that registration. But now I cannot get statutory damages and attorney's fees. I can only get them if the infringing activities take place after the registration. And believe me, so now what are you left with? You're left with actual damages. And I say, good luck proving them. And that's why statutory damages exist. You can get $750 to $30,000 per copyright infringement just for the sake of showing up. The judge can, can do that. All right. Enough about, if I just find my, let's just move on. All right, cease and desist letter. Uh, I cannot tell you, I've said this for the end, folks, uh, and you're gonna think this is, sounds crazy. Do not send a cease and desist letter to anyone. And I know what you're thinking, how am I gonna stop people from infringing, you know, my trademarks, patents, copyrights, et cetera. Sending someone a cease and desist letter that says that they're infringing means that they are entitled to sue you in their jurisdiction by you saying that. Now, so what do you do? You don't send a cease and desist letter, you send a letter saying, hey, by the way, my name's Gary Lambert, I represent X Corporation, you folks are doing X or X, Y, and Z, take a look at our registration, kindly get back to me. All right, what do I do if you get one of these? Not a good idea to ignore them. People hate it when people get ignored. Uh, I would either negotiate, comply if you want to, sometimes that's the case when you don't have money, or respond with facts and law, either by yourself or with an attorney. Now, uh, that's the last slide, folks. I'm gonna end it by saying how I started. If you've got questions, pop them down. Uh, 
they're going to come to me. I'm going to answer them. We're going to tie this up with this, with the presentation. And I want to thank you very much for listening and uh, and watching. And if you got any questions, give me a call on my cell phone, 603-438-6333. Thank you very much.